everyone, I would like to introduce to you my grandmother, Susan Bowie McGee. She was born and raised in Southern California and went to Pomona College to receive her bachelor's degree in international relations. She later went to the Wharton School of Finance at the University of Pennsylvania to receive her MBA. President Ford appointed her as a White House fellow, and the fellowship, this fellowship program brings a group of young people each year to Washington, D.C. to work for members of the White House and cabinet secretaries um, sorry, to learn how the highest levels of the government work. She loved it so much that she stayed in Washington, D.C. for the last four decades. <laughs> After working in business and government, she changed careers completely to work in the healing arts. She now teaches meditation and leads healing circles at the Washington National Cathedral. She is also the author of a book, Inks of Light, The Healing Art of Calm Aaron, which is the story of a Holocaust survivor and artist. Today, she is going to share with us his journey and invite us to be detectives in understanding how the Holocaust affected his life. Thank you. Hi, guys. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Pamela Madigan for inviting me to do this. I want to thank Natalia for suggesting it. Um, this is a story close to my heart. It's in, I was involved writing a book about this man's life for nine years, and it was published in 2012. But I want to, so today, he was 16 years old when his life turned upside down. So he's about two or three years older than you guys, right? Um, so what I want to do before I take you on the journey of his life and the adventure, and as Natalia said, I'm going to ask you to be detectives to find out from looking at his paintings how the Holocaust impacted him and how he dealt with it over a lifetime of paintings. But first I want to ask you to close your eyes a minute and use your imagination. Go to a place in your home that's very safe, warm, comfortable. And see yourself there doing whatever you love to do by yourself, with family, with parents, with siblings, with dogs, with cats. And just imagine yourself comfortably in your home. And one day, on the, uh, you hear uh, knock, knock, knock. Keep your eyes closed. Two men walk in. They call your father, and they take him out of the house. You will never see him again. You don't know for sure what's going on. You, any siblings you have, and your mom are still in your home. Two months later, another knock, knock, knock. They come into your home, these two men, and they say to you, take whatever you can put on your back. You're leaving your home. We're going to march you to an entirely different neighborhood, which they do. So you, your mom, and in Common's case, his brother, left their home forever walked, 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 and went to a little neighborhood of about eight blocks where they put 30,000 Jews in. So just imagine yourself being walked away from your neighborhood. You're never going to see your neighbors again. You're never going to see your friends again. You're never going to go to the school that you love. And take a moment as you think about what it would feel like to lose family, home, neighbors, friends, and I want you to pick a color. If you were to draw, I want you to feel this rather than think about it. See what it feels like inside. And choose a color. If you were to draw the feeling, what color would you use to draw that feeling? And just take a moment and make a decision about that. You don't have to tell me the color, but just tune into the feeling. And if you were an artist and you were to draw how you felt, what color would you use on paper? to represent that feeling. And now open your eyes, and let me introduce you to my friend, Common Aaron. Common was a master artist. He was born an artist. When he was three, he had a pencil in his hand, and he was drawing the faces of his mother, his father, his friends. He also is a Holocaust survivor. He was 16, as I said, when he lost everything. His whole world turned upside down. He spent four years in the Holocaust, two and a half in a ghetto in Latvia. He was born in Riga, Latvia. Who knows where Latvia is? Can you see it on the map? Okay, tell us where it is. Latvia, it's a country in Eastern Europe. It borders Lithuania and Estonia, which are in the Baltic That's right. And it's uh, and, and that's exactly right. And it's also next to it's also next to to Russia. 
Now, we're going to solve a mystery together today. Um, so I'm going to need you to pay really close attention. Um, as we go through this, his story is in his art. You're going to see a painting that you saw recently. So be watching for it, and when you see it, please raise your hand. You'll know, you'll recognize it when you see it. You saw it at the Holocaust Museum that you went to in LA. It's one of Common's masterpieces. All right. I'm going to let Common tell you in his own words what happened on that day. He had the first gentleman come into their, his home and take away his father. My father was taken out. My mother was not taken out, but pretending they were taking him, him and my uncle, to to uh, to work to to work to do a job for the Germans, which is obviously pretension. My father never came back. My uncle came back. It's the, the worst horror story you can imagine. And uh, and uh, he was there for a few days, and then they finally came back. They let him go for some reason. Then they pulled them out again, and none of them came back. If you didn't do what they told you to do, you could be dead. They, they would shoot you. And I've seen some shooting in that camp too. Guy stepped out of the row, and if it, if it, if it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, he was too weak to stand straight. He kept on moving out, and he kept on telling him to go back, and he wouldn't go back. Go up and take a gun and shoot him right in front of everybody. We would ask ourselves the question, where is God, you know? And these people never did anything wrong, you know? And they died, and we were alive. You know? It was quite a, uh, quite a problem, you know, for us to even think about God at that time, for some of us. Now, mo a lot of people, many people in the camps that came out of the camps became ultra, very religious because they felt that they were, God saved them, you know? Uh, with me, it, was, uh, it was not, didn't happen that way. Common spent two and a half years in the Riga ghetto, and when I was researching this story, I went to the U. I went over to the camps as well, but I started out in the in Washington D.C. at the U.S. Holocaust Museum, looking for evidence of what happened to Common. This was one of the first photos I found. It's of the Riga ghetto. As I said, it was a. It's a I've been there. It's about eight blocks. They put thirty thousand Jews in the in there. When Common arrived, he, he and his mom and his brother were told, pick a room and they lived in one room along with other people um, in that eight block area. So what did he do? Um, Common began to take risks doing two things. Because he could draw, he took a chance of drawing a picture of the guard. Now if he were caught with pencil and paper, they could have killed him because they, could have, they would have suspected he was trying to get a message outside the ghetto. Because the ghetto was in, it would have uh, prison wire all around it. You went out in the morning to work, and at night when you came home, you were in prison in that ghetto. So he would do a drawing of a guard, and he was working in a factory that sent jackets to the Russian, to the Germans on the Russian front. There was a German who, who loved art, and he saw one of Kalman's drawings. So he went and he got a canvas, and he asked Kalman to paint a portrait of him which Kalman did. Why did he do all this? To get an extra piece of bread for himself and his brother. So that is a theme for Kalman throughout his life of how he survived, was using his ability to draw. He tried to escape. One time they were on their way to the truck, uh, the factory, and he skipped out and he went to a friend from school, a family, not a Jewish family, another family, and said, will you hide my brother and myself? And the family said, I wish we could, but if they find us, they will kill us. So Common kept doing things to try and escape from the ghetto. Now, he learned to do something that's very interesting. He began to teach himself how to disappear, how to be invisible. It is not a talent I have ever developed, and I don't know how you do that. But he began to watch really carefully the guards in particular, the prisoners, and make himself disappear. That talent that he thinks helped keep him alive would affect his artistic career for the rest of his life, and I'll tell you about that when we get to it. 
Now, the ghetto closed after two and a half years. Why? Because the Russians were coming back into Latvia, and they moved these prisoners to three camps in a freezing forest in the Baltic forest in Latvia. I mean, freezing. He was in one camp um, where they lived in straw huts. And this is in the middle of the winter in the northern Baltic area. It was freezing. Again, he got a pencil and he drew a guard, and the guard showed it to the commandant. And the commandant said, bring that man to my quarters. So for two weeks, Common was in the warm quarters of the commandant. He did a portrait of him, and then the commandant gave him a photograph of his mother and father, and he put it, he wanted to put it in a little ring. And Common said, I took as long as I could to do that photo, because as long as he was working, he, he, had, he was warm. He also met, they had a small group of women in this camp, I've been to this area, I mean, it was out nowhere in, in, the, in the forest. There was a Hungarian girl, and they weren't supposed to talk to each other, but they would sneak around, and they would chat, and she would sing in Hungarian, and he would talk in, in Latvian. He remembered that. When I did this story, uh, he asked me when he was 78, and when we got to this part of the story, he became extraordinarily emotional when he remembered the relationship he had very briefly with this young girl. He got her to work in the commandant's tent to protect her and get her more food. But when they moved them out of that camp to another camp, they marched the women to the sea and killed them. He never saw her again. He thought maybe in a lifetime he'd find her. He's ne he never found her. He was, she was probably killed in, in the Baltic Sea. What else did he do to survive? When I asked him that, he said, I was young and I was strong, so I could work hard. He said that was a gift. What they did in that ghetto, five months after the Germans first came to Riga, they took 25,000 women, older people, and children, they marched them out to the Rumula forest, and they executed them. So when Kalman and his brother came back from work one day, his mom was gone, there were dead people on the street, they just executed them all. So they were left to work, there were some, he, he was not killed because he was young and he was strong and he could work. So he always told me that helped him survive. Common was, at, and this is something that I take into my life and I think we all can, he was absolutely determined to survive and paint again one day. So whatever our passions are, his passion to, to paint kept him alive and gave him a purpose. So we have to think in our own lives when things get tough, what do I really care about? What is my purpose? And where is my determination to be, stay around to do that, that particular purpose? As I mentioned, <clears throat> he learned to be invisible. He told me one day, he said he watched people, prisoners, who were not necessarily starving at the time. If they gave up hope, they were dead within two days. He said, Susan, I never gave up hope. I lived one minute at a time, but I never gave up hope. He tried to escape another time after they, he was in three camps in the Baltic forest. The Russians were coming into Latvia. They, they didn't leave the Jews in the camps. They marked, the Germans marched them to the sea. And when they got near the boat, Kalman left the column and he hid in a pile of hay. There was a child who saw him and turned him in. So his attempts to, to escape didn't work, but he kept trying. Kalman had another very special connection that I think helped him live, and you see it in his paintings. He's all, he always painted landscapes. He loved nature. These are the words of Kalman. He ended up going across Europe. He was in three camps in Latvia. Then he was put on a boat, taken down to Poland, put on a barge, taken to Stuhhof, which was another camp. Was, I've been there. It's like it happened yesterday. From there one day, he was put on a cattle car, and he was taken into Germany to Buchenwald, and he worked in a sub-camp called Riemsdorf. From there, he ended up in a forced march to Theresienstadt when the Allies started bombing the area of Riemsdorf, and he ended up in Czechoslovakia. But let me just share his own words when i talking about the camp in Buchenwald. Buchenwald was a huge camp. I've forgotten. It could have been 100,000 prisoners. In Buchenwald, they put us in the quarantine area called the Little Camp, it was very crowded. The barracks were full. What outdoor tents they had were full of Jewish prisoners. We didn't have a place to sleep. So I slept outdoors on the ground with a rock. 
as my pillow. My connection to life was through nature, for the Germans could not remove the stars from the sky, nor could they stop the sun from rising in the morning, and they couldn't stop the trees from growing in the little camp. This was a connection I had to the world I had long since left, and every morning I awoke and saw the sun, I said to myself, I've survived another day. When the war ended, he was in Czechoslovakia in a camp. He was supposed to have been gassed the next day. The Russians liberated the camp, but didn't liberate Kalman because he was a Latvian. They took the three Latvians and three Lithuanians and took them out to the country. And they didn't know whether they were going to be sent to the Red Army or whether they were going to be sent to Siberia. So one night they decided to escape. And they had no idea where they were. So they escaped. Now they had their heads shaved. It's very clear that they were, you know, uh, Holocaust survivors at this time. They escape and a, a man comes by, a Russian man in a, a truck, and he stops and he says in Yiddish, I am you, where do you need to go? And they said Prague. And he said, I'll get you there, we'll put you in the back of the truck, but once you're there, you're on your own. So he gets to Prague. One of his friends, Latvian friends, says to him, I think we're safer if we get to the sector where the Americans are. So they walk overnight to a place called Pilsen. Eventually, they end up in Salzburg as refugees in Austria. What does Colin do to get food? He draws, and he gets money for food. Well, there was an American soldier who was a former judge who took two of his drawings, sent them to Vienna, uh, to the Fine Arts Academy. It's one of the finest art schools in Europe. Colin was offered a two-year scholarship. His friend said, you're crazy, you, you, you know, you'll starve. Well, he went and he got his degree. But then what did he choose to do? His friends went back to Latvia and he said, mm -mm, they killed my mom, they killed my dad, I am not going back. He got a visa to come across the Atlantic Ocean all the way to Los Angeles. So at the end of 1949, he arrives in Los Angeles with $4 in his pocket. So he left the, the cold of the old world, and Riga is a cold, cold climate. And he arrives in Los Angeles. And I asked myself, as I was writing this book, what did LA offer to him? I, I grew up there. I, I was born in Hollywood. I grew up in Glendale, so I know LA, LA well. When you think of having been imprisoned, LA has big, wide horizons. It's a very different space than what he was used to, both during the Holocaust and in Riga. It's a place for new beginnings. It's a home of creativity. Think of the, you know, Walt Disney, Steven Spielberg. It's a place where people can follow their muse, if you will. And then finally, this um, common equated being invisible with life, and if he were seen, he would die. That belief system stayed with him for the next years of his life, the next decades, until he chose to remember and tell his story. So, he became a famous, no, I won't say it. He became a, 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 he became a successful artist. He painted people like Ronald Reagan. This is ra a rabbi in Los Angeles. He, can, he used pencil, he used oils, he used pastels, he used acrylics. He could do it all. And here's a, a painting, an oil painting. It's one of my favorites. Take a look and tell me what you see in the eyes of this jazz musician. Raise your hand and let me know what you see. Yes. 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 And they look pretty sad, right? Calm and learn how the emotions of people because he studied people so closely during the Holocaust. Now something else he's always painted are landscapes, and I'll show. I'm just going to show you a couple of pieces of his art. This is the mayor of Beverly Hills' home. This one is the roofs of Chignon in France. He did a lot of studies of people, which was they named it psychological realism. Here are two older men playing checkers. Here's a woman in blue, and if you look at his painting, you'll see him use. Um, a couple of bodies of color. And this one, I want you to take a look at this one. This is called The Dreamer. Take a look at this a minute. 
and tell me what you, you see in this painting. What's happening? Where is this person? Yes. They're asleep. Yes, they're yeah, dreaming, right? In their house. Yes, yes. So Common, I think, when he painted, was in this place. It was a safe place for him to go whenever he painted. And I think he went to that space when he was in the camps some as well. Okay, so how did I get to know this man? In 1951, my mom, who was at that time an interior designer, went into a gallery and saw this boy with black eyes, um, and it went straight to her heart because my parents' first child was a baby with black eyes, jet black eyes, who had died about 10 years earlier. So she asked, who did it? I would like him to come. She learned that he in part survived at the Holocaust by drawing the guards, uh, photos the guards would bring with their children. She said, I'd like him to come to my home, pay my two living daughters, and paint the baby that we lost. And this is the, the photo, this is a portrait of Nani that this man painted from a small little photograph. And I have this, this pastel, it's a beautiful painting. He then painted this portrait of me, and I can remember the day he was about 27, I was six years old, and this man walks into our house and puts up this easel and he starts going like this, and when he's done, I look and I thought, my God, that looks like me. <laughs> so that's how we met. 50 years later, out in Palm Springs, visiting with my mom, Common came out, and he had just seen the movie The Pianist. Have any of you seen the movie The Pianist? It, it's about a Polish pianist who survives the Holocaust. Common saw it, and he said, I have never, ever wanted to tell my story. I've never been interested in having a movie made of it. But he said, seeing that movie gave me permission. Now, I've known him for 50 years, and completely out of the blue, he turned to me with his blue eyes, and he said, Susan, will you write my story? That was in 2003. He was 78. So what I'm going to do, this is where you get to be detectives. I'm going to show you some paintings that he did when he was first here in the 50s. And then I'm going to show you the same genre, landscapes or kids, children. And I want you to notice how they've changed. Because what I learned was, what he painted was a mirror of his, what was going on inside him. It was a mirror of his own interior landscape. So that's how I got his story. When I asked him, what was the impact of the Holocaust on your life, your art, and how did, how did you respond over a lifetime? He looked at me with his blue eyes and he said, I don't know. He painted it. So I had to find the answers in his paintings. Anybody recognize this? Yeah. Yeah. All right. When you were at the Holocaust um, Museum, as you walk in, this is hanging on the wall. It's called The Mother and Child. He, he did this in 1951 at night. And take a look at it and tell me what you see or feel in this painting. Yes. Sadness. Yes. What else? Love. Love. Fierce love, right? And what he said was, this represented what he saw happen in the ghetto, where mothers would just hold on to their babies, just glue to them, so to, not, so to not to lose them. So this is paintings about eight feet tall, three feet wide. He had it. He never showed this painting. He had it in his uh, studio, kind of hidden for over 60 years until one day after he'd written, uh, after the book had been written. Okay, here are some other early paintings of, of Commons. The first one on top is Common sleeping next to the rock. He did that in light of what he did in Buchenwald, where he had to sleep on the ground. The other one is called Haunted Visage, and these are done in the 50s, and so this is what Common is sort of working with on canvas, not in his mind, but through his art. What do you see in these paintings? How does it feel? How do these feel? Scary. Mm -hmm. Who else? It's gray. Gray? Yeah. Pretty dark, huh? Yes. Depressing. Depressing, quite. When the, and when he first came in the 50s, um, 
he began to stay away from other survivors because he said all they do is talk about what happened and it just took him right down into the pit. And he said, I couldn't survive. So he made a decision early on to bury it all until 50 years later when he asked to have a story told. Something that Kalman has always painted again for himself because he loves doing it, are children. <clears throat> Tell me what you, what does this suggest to you about where Kalman was in his own world? Yes. 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 Pardon? Alone. alone. Totally alone. He said to me, and it's in the book, he felt a loneliness that was beyond anything he could ever understand. And in part, after he lost some of the people he knew in the Holocaust, like the Hungarian woman, young woman, girl, he began to stay alone to himself because he didn't want to see more people killed. One of his best friends in one of the camps was blown up by a, a bomb. So here, here's a child completely surrounded by darkness. But what's always interesting in Common's paintings, there's a lot of vitality in the red wrap. There's still something alive in this child. All right. This painting is one my mother bought. Just, it's fascinating to me. It's called The Lost Children. Common went to visit a friend who was a Holocaust survivor in Brooklyn, New York. And two children were walking down the street, and he, as he often did, drew them, brought it home, and then made a painting. Take a look at this, particularly the face of the, of the girl. What, what do you see? Yeah? Yep. That's right. That's right. Yes? Both of you. <laughs> Smudged. It's not clear. That's right. Yes? A little louder? Bright? Yeah. Color is like blank. Proper? Blank. Blank. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Lost. Absolutely. When I was working with Common, we were talking about this painting, and this is what he said to me. I put the face of an old woman on the little girl. I don't know why. So if you're children who have survived the Holocaust, you would clearly be old before your time. All right. Now here are three things. One of the, the face of the girl in red, the lost children, and the one on the far side is my nephew Eric, which he painted in the late 70s. So if you look at three different paintings, the first two done in the 50s when he first came here, and these paintings he did for himself, and then you look at Eric, what do you see has changed in how he portrays a child? Yes. Right, it's clear and you could tell who it was if you knew him. Lights come back in, in the, the eyes of the child and color. So his, his, what's happening to Calvin over, 50, over 30 years is he's beginning to reclaim his own light. When you go through an experience like he did, you lose your light, you send it out to the ends of the universe in order to survive. You send parts of your spirits out to the ends of the universe. Same thing happens when people go to war. When you come back, you have a choice to pull in that light and pull those pieces back. You can see Common doing this over 30, 40 years of painting, which is pretty powerful. OK, now we're going to look at uh, a couple slides of his landscapes. He was working um, making maps in, in the early 50s. Uh, drawing maps for a man's company. And on lunch, this is where he went and decided to do on his own. He decided to go up to Bunker Hill in LA. This is where the old Victorian tenements were before the Chandler Center was sitting there. And he drew this. So if this is a reflection of his interior landscape, what's going on with Calvin inside? Yes. Dark. Dark. Yes. Depressed. Yes. Gloomy. Gloomy. Absolutely gloomy. Yes. Um, it looks like a house that you don't feel comfortable in. Like right. Comfort. 
maybe even ghostly. <laughs> yes. Empty. 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 Yes. Broken. Broken. Indeed. Yes. Pardon? Haunted. It looks like a haunted house. Now look closely. There are no people, no color, no animals, no plants, and no trees. When I was doing this book, I realized that was Coleman inside in 1951 when he painted this, when he drew it. Yes. Oh, I thought you had to paint it. Now, 30 years later, no, actually on this one, it's, it's 50 years later. This is a view, 35 years later, this is a view of uh, downtown Los Angeles from his balcony on his, in his apartment. How has it, it changed? How has his interior landscape changed? Yes? Um, it's like more vibrant and colorful and like not really dark and stuff. Like like that's right. There, she, what she said is it's lighter, it's, it's not dark like the other ones. Yes? Happy and peaceful, absolutely. Yes? Came back, yeah. The other, he said the other one was empty. This has life that's come back in the plants, the trees, yes. Much more alive, yeah. So what this told me in writing his story is Common was much more alive. All right. Now, the, this next series are really fun. These are self-portraits. This is a port self-portrait he did of marching in the camp. This is when he gets back in the, in, to L.A. in the early 50s. The man in the center is Coleman. He's also on the right. And as I studied this, I realized that there were faces of Coleman everywhere in the sense you see somebody who's frightened, the white one on the left, you see a, somebody with a beard, kind of a white. They were all aspects of Colin. But tell me what you see here in this painting. Yes? The person's eyes are like not there. It looks like they're like they're inside. He's dead inside. There's no light. No eye, no light in his eyes. Yes? Yes. Skeletal, right? Yes. Very sad. Very sad. Yes. They look similar. Yep. Yes. All the what? All the hopes been sucked out. So this is sort of an image of what we humans do to each other when we treat each other the way that the Europeans, not just the Germans, because there were other countries that participated a lot, you know, in this in the war. But this is what we do to each other when we dehumanize somebody and treat them as though they are not a real person. This is the result. Now, this is one of my favorite ones. Take a look at this drawing. Common did this when he was 30 years old in Los Angeles. He was about 25 when he came to America. He's 30 years old here. Take a good look at this drawing and tell me what you notice. Yes. It's it's a yes, it's a drawing, it's a self portrait. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, look at the two eyes. Are they looking in the same direction? No. It's as though one is caught in the Holocaust, but he knows that world was real. And the other one's in LA little wary about what's... Go ahead. Determined. Always determined. Yes. That's right. No emotion on his face. Look at the color. Yes. Yes. Half of it is, is in, the, in the shadow and half of his face is in the light. So what that... Go ahead. Yes. You can feel it, right? Now, yes? Um, it looks like he's trying to like keep it inside, how yes. the Holocaust affected him, but it's hard for him, like it's taking over his body because yes. the darkness is kind of going over to the other side. Yeah. Um, 
when as I was writing his, uh, let me tell you how I got his story since he couldn't tell it to me. I took a hundred of his paintings out to Cape May, New Jersey. It's a place in the beach, at the beach in Cape May, New Jersey, by myself for five months. And I had them, you know, I had them organize landscapes, self-portraits, children, psychological realism. And I'd walk the beach, I'd look at a number of them, and I'd walk the beach and say, okay, what, what is this telling me about Colin, about what was going on with him when he painted it? And these paintings started talking to me. And this one was really important, because what I picked up was, he knows these two different worlds exist. He's not integrated them yet. He's, he's still got half of himself back in the Holocaust, half of himself in LA, but not integrated yet. Now let me show you the next portrait he did of himself when he was 43. This is the one on the right. It's the one with the uh, red background. Tell me how you think Common has changed from 24 when he first came to LA to 30 to 43. What do you see in that third portrait? Self-portrait, yes. So there's more vibrancy, more color. Yeah. Face looks better. What else? Yes. He seems calmer. Yes. He seems like he kind of wants to smile because he's a lot more happier than like first drawing. Yep. Take a look at his eyes. What emotion do you see in Common's eyes? Yes? Yes. You think so? Yeah? At ease. So uh, if you look at these three, there's a lot more color in his face, which means there's more color in his soul. Tell me what you think the red background means. What does the color red mean in terms of feelings and emotions? Anger, yeah, it's anger. So he still has the sorrow and the anger, but he's clearly more alive than he was in the first two, right? All right. So what Common, when I gave Common this book, the name of the book is Into the Light, The Healing Art of Common Air, and he said, why did you title it that? I said, read your own book and you'll find out. He read the book and he looked at me with his blue eyes and he said, Susan, I do not know how an American girl could possibly understand what a European man went through. You've done it. You've done it poetically. Keep doing what you're doing. So he got, he didn't know that he was healing himself in his art over three decades, four decades. He didn't even, and, and he read the book, he said, it's the right title, Susan. So this was all done unconsciously using his commitment to the muse making art, which really kept him alive for a lifetime. This um, painting on your right, no, on your left is a silver lake. I don't know, it's a neighborhood in LA. I don't know if you know it. This is one that he did early on in the 50s. And then this is another view from his apartment at the Hollywood Hills. And you can clearly see that he's left this black and white world. And now he's living in a, a world of color. So what I learned from studying his paintings is that he had done a lot of healing. But he still kept himself under the radar. And I talked to him about this invisibility. And he looked at me again with his blue eyes. He said, that's right. If I'm invisible, they can't kill me. So that he was a you know, successful artist all his life. He was never famous like he should be for his talent. And what we figured out is that was that invisibility. He had to stay under the radar for fear of being killed. So when he was 78, he made a decision to tell his story. The process of doing that, I stirred the pot of memories. I went over there, I went to Buchenwald, I found a piece of paper with his number on it that he got the day he was ar arrived in Buchenwald. I talked to other Latvian survivors over there. So I went to, when I was at the US Holocaust Museum in DC, I said, do you have any his historical papers about who was freed when at Tinner of Terenzenstadt in 45. And this young man says, follow me. He comes out with a little book mimeographed by the Swiss Red Cross. And there was Colin's name. So I was picking up all this kind of information. So I was stirring the pot for Colin's, uh, of his memories. And, and so there were certain costs for his decision 
to tell his story. He started having nightmares again. This is in, in I, we started in 2003. It took nine years to write it. His heart started racing. Um, he had a lot of trips to the hospital. So what I learned was the experience he had was viscerally in his body. And as he remembered more, he had a physical reaction to it. It was very powerful. Now, there was, here are the benefits. This is why it was good that he told this story. He took a chance. He opened up his heart and married for the fourth time. He let go of the past. And this is what is so powerful to me. After the book was published, we had a big thing at the museum in LA, the Simon Wiesenthal Museum. Coleman, when asked, allowed his Holocaust echoes, I call them echoes of the Holocaust, those early paintings, he allowed them to be shown in a gallery. And he allowed the mother and child finally to leave his basement studio and go hang in the museum, of the LA Museum of the Holocaust, which, which is where you saw it. And there's Coleman sitting with it. So he was able to let go of the past. And he was willing to be seen. When, we did the when I did the first presentation of the story in LA at the Simon Wiesenthal Center, there two governors were there, Governor Gray Davis of California, Pete Wilson, Rabbi Heyer. I did a full presentation on his story and his art. And he was sitting in the audience. And I kept looking at him. Is he, can he handle this much visibility? And then he came up on the stage, and we chatted. And he was able to be seen in a way that he never could have been before. And my theory is the pain of not remembering became greater than the pain of remembering. And that's why he chose to tell his story. All right, so in the end, Common achieved a certain amount of peace. He just died this year, this past year. He never will forget the Holocaust. He did a drawing, I don't have it in here, in the late 90s of a woman caught in the Holocaust. So that memory is in there but he did a whole lot of healing, and he found a certain ease in his life. Now, after the book was published, what did Common do? And I'm gonna let him in his own words talk to you. Um, it's what he did all of his life. So just listen to him. I enjoy painting. I don't know why, but I've been always doing it. I'm just playing around with, uh, with the abstracts that I'm doing. Non-objective, not abstract. Non-objective, watercolor. I found a, a box of watercolor, pencil watercolors. I got very excited about it, and I started working on it, and I enjoyed it. For three days or four days or five days, I've been working on it and making new things. Uh, that I've never done before. I start doing something, and, and then I develop it, and make it, put some colors on it, and then I see what it looks like, and then I change it, you know. I'm not thinking what I'm going to do, but at the same time, I'm thinking of, 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 of doing a composition. I don't want to, the composition has, has to be there. That's a big thing for me. There's no object there. Before that, all these years, I've been doing portraits of people, uh, landscapes, but I've done portraits all my life since I was six years old. So, I, I want to do a, a little experiment today with all of you. Um, think for a moment of the things that Coleman did to keep himself alive, and then when he came to America to heal and to thrive. And give me some examples. What do you think he did that helped him live, survive, and then live in LA? What are some of the things he did, tools he used? Yes. His art and painting, that was the most important thing in his life. And it, it really did motivate him to survive the Holocaust. And then, you know, he, he remained committed to it for an entire life. Well, what other kinds of risks did Common take? Because this is all going to come back to you guys, because we're going to do a little exercise about how you can meet your challenges. They're not going to be as, the same as Common's, but we all have challenges. What other things did he, risks did he take? Yes? Uh, he tried to, es escape. tried to escape several times, that's right. Yes? Um, he painted for um, the guards. Yes. Yeah. That was huge. That's how he got the extra breath. Yes? He tried to be invisible. He did. He absolutely did. Does anyone in this room know how to be invisible? I don't know how to do it. But he learned. What else did he do? Left the old world? 
left his, his old world behind and came to an entirely new place. Never gave up hope, was determined. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. I want you to think about challenges that you have in your life right now, today. It can be stress or anxiety about school, a relationship where you were hurt, parents who divorced, whatever's going on, we all have challenges throughout our entire, our entire lives. So I want you to think a minute about a challenge that you have. And then I'm going to lead you in a little meditation to see what strengths come to you to use to meet your own challenge. So take a minute and close your eyes and take three very deep breaths. And as you exhale, excel all of the worries, concerns, thoughts about yesterday, today, and tomorrow and allow your body to come into a very peaceful state of being. Eyes closed. Take another very deep breath all the way down to your feet. And as you exhale, release all concerns, worries, issues in your life and just invite your body to be peaceful and relaxed. And one more very deep breath. <coughs> Breathe all the way down to your heels and then as you exhale, invite your body to come to a peaceful, relaxed state of being. And then I want you to use your imagination to go to one of your favorite places in the world. It can be at the beach, it can be in the mountains, it can be in your home, in your yard, a place that you love. It can be in the desert. So with your imagination, see yourself standing in this beautiful place Allow yourself to be present with all your five senses. Feel the earth under your feet. Take a deep breath and feel the fresh air. With your imagination, look up to the sky. Notice if it's a clear blue sky. Notice if there are any clouds. Feel the sun on your face and the gentle wind. And now I want you to imagine wherever you are, a beautiful fire. If you're outside, it's like a fire. If you're inside, it's a fireplace. Sit down next to that circle of fire. And let bubble up challenge you currently have in your life. Let it become conscious. Kind of notice where in your body this challenge sits. The energy of every challenge, whether it's a, a fear, a hurt, a sorrow, always has a location in your body. And you can simply scan your body. Ask it to become aware of where this particular energy is sitting in your body. And we're going to ask some light to come into that place of your body and invite that energy, that challenge to come out, sit on a nice platter right in front of you. your awareness, go into the energy on the platter and let it speak to you. What does it say? How does it feel? Is it something you're frightened of? Is it something you're sad about?
and now be back in your body there. And as you look and feel this challenge, ask yourself, what strengths and talents do you have to meet that challenge? you no longer be a victim of a challenge. Take your power back. Be fully present. It may be a simple change of attitude, the way you look at it. It may be a challenge that requires an action. the wise part of yourself. How to deal and overcome whatever the challenge is so that you're in your full power with a little P so that you carry all the light you can possibly carry in your body so that you can be the radiant being that you are. Ask for a picture or a word or phrase that symbolizes your ability to meet this challenge and stay in your power and walk radiantly upon this earth. slowly I'm going to invite you to come back I'll count to five bless this space know it's a space you can go to anytime when you feel challenged about anything to connect with your own wisdom with nature and if you wish if that challenge is still sitting on a platter you can ask spirit just to remove it and wherever it was placed in your body, you can invite the vibration of courage, trust, peace, love. So before you come back, pick what you want to replace that part in your body. <coughs> now I'll count from one to five. One, coming back. Two, three, halfway back. Four and five, fully present in the theater. And thank you guys for a lovely time.